one of the biggest things when I realized my dad was acquitted was I thought about the families and all those families fighting out there, and I didn't want them to be discouraged. You know, I still believe him getting to court was a huge win. And even if we didn't get it past the finish line, I just want families to realize that there is so much power in media attention and getting those resources that come with media attention, right? When police departments and states or, you know, state prosecutors are kind of put on the spot of like, this case is everywhere. What are you going to do? More resources are allocated to those cases. So I, I want families to know that just because, you know, my dad wasn't found guilty, that it it's not all for nothing and that they need to keep fighting. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to True Crime with Kendall Ray. I am so happy to have you here today to talk about yet another case. And if you're new, then welcome. Be sure to click subscribe. So as you can see, I am not in my normal studio. I'm actually on the set of The Sesh, which we have kind of transformed a little bit because today's episode is going to be a little different. I am joined with Sarah Turney, a good friend of mine. It's been so long since we've actually seen each other in person, and yeah. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to talk with you know many other people. You're, you've been such a good friend to me over the years, and I'm just so excited Sarah. and grateful to be here. Thank you for saying that. I mean, you're just amazing, and we really have developed such a friendship over the years, which has been just amazing. And I can't believe that it's been five years since we first started talking. I know. Time flies for real. I know. And I'm like terrible at math. But when I started thinking about it, I was like, oh my God, holy yeah. cow, five yep. years. It was 2018, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Like I, I remember right. It was like May or June of 2018. Yeah. So yeah, over five years now. And we've collaborated several different times, but never in this format. I know. We're doing like a really formal sit down interview and I'm, I'm really excited. So if you are not familiar with Sarah, she is the host of Voices for Justice podcast and sister of Alyssa Turney. Now, many of you are probably familiar with Alyssa's case. If you are into true crime at all, I'm sure you've heard of it. And you've probably heard Sarah talk about it, whether that's on my show or someone else's show, because you have been hugely involved in getting her story out there. I will be summarizing Alyssa's case here in a bit, and that will be done at my home studio, just to give you guys kind of a recap. Although it's important that you go and check out other mediums of content on Alyssa's case. Obviously, the Voices for Justice podcast is going to be the best source. We also did our video in 2018, like I mentioned, and then you came back and did another episode with Josh and I in 2019. So we will have all of that linked below to familiarize yourself with the case more. I know I had mentioned last week to kind of look into everything before we have this interview, or you could be a little bit confused. And, you know, my episode today is going to be a little bit different than normal, uh, my normal style, because we will be doing a really candid interview. Sarah has a lot that she is finally ready to open up about. I mean, it has been some time since you've been able to speak so freely. Three years. Well, and really... I've never been able to fully speak freely, I feel, because yeah. I was always so worried about everything coming back to Alyssa, which, you know, so I just kind of edited myself a little bit and really uh, took a back seat and tried to just tell her story and focus on her. So yeah. this is new to me, too. I've done so many interviews, but I'm not used to talking like this. I'm ready to talk. It's It's been a long three years. It's been a long journey. And now I can say what I would like to say without hurting her. So it's a different ballgame. Yeah. And that's mainly because, you know, the case finally did go to trial. And then very recently, in July of 2023, Michael Turney was acquitted. It's insane. Um, yeah. It was definitely an outcome that nobody really expected. And from what I'm told by experts, it's a pretty rare ruling. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. That's what I've heard too. And, you know, we had been talking behind the scenes and you started telling me that you felt nervous about things and starting to feel doubtful. And at the time when you said that, I was like, I couldn't even let my mind go there. So I was just like, no, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. But you were right. And we have a lot to go over uh, when it comes to that. I know I've gotten so many requests to talk about the trial and I wanted to wait until I had Sarah here to explain everything from her point of view since you were there for it all. And really, you got the case to that point. And you should be so proud of yourself for everything that you've done for your sister. It's truly amazing. 
Thanks. I mean, you're going to make me cry in like the first two minutes already. And I think that's where so much peace comes in. You know what I mean? I, yeah. at the end of the day, I, you know, I'm sure there are a few things I could have done more for her, right? More interviews, whatever it might be, but I'm, I'm at peace with what I did for her. I mean, I feel like you what more so much. could I have done? Yeah, not truly. And it's like a fine line too, because you know, you have to be careful when a trial could be happening in the near future and what you say and everything. So you've had to toe a line and now you're free to do, you know, whatever you want, speak however you want. Yeah. And I'm sure, I know you've told me also behind the scenes that it's been kind of a relief in a way. Um, obviously this is not the outcome that you wanted and it's a really hard pill to swallow, but it has given you a sense of your life back in a way. I know you've been working on falling back in love with life. Yeah. Like you've been saying that. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, we're calling it um, me and my friends, whatever the the Sarah era, right? And I Sarah era, I know. Yes, um, and yeah, I am trying to fall back in love with life because my, I mean, when I say Alyssa consumed my life, I mean it. Like you know, yeah. it became my job, it became my entire world. Yes, I lost personal relationships because of it. I would do it again in a heartbeat. I would do anything for her. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I did. I gave up everything for her, and I don't regret it. But this has been my life since I was 12. You know, when she first went missing, I created her flyer. I created her website. And while, of course, I had my teenage years where I thought that she'd just run away and I tried to forget about it and I wasn't actively advocating, it has felt like my burden since I was 12. And of course, you know, I became the police contact person when I was just like 17. So yeah. I've had that responsibility for decades. And now that I don't, um, and not to say that all responsibility is gone, but now that it's really, really lessened, I kind of don't know what to do with myself. And I'm really finding myself again, my my own identity outside of just advocating for her. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's been a really freeing experience. I mean, a lot of mixed emotions here. Obviously, we're going to be discussing quite a bit about how all of this has affected you and what your experience has been like. And I really want to focus on that today. And I mean, that is such a huge win in itself that you were able to actually get in that courtroom and for charges to be pressed and everything. That was truly amazing. And it didn't go the way you wanted, but I, I, I've told you before, I think you should be very proud for how far you did get things. We're also going to be talking about how the trial was completely mishandled. We're going to be talking about the recent ABC 2020 their newest episode, which has really exploited your trauma. Yeah. And I mean, we'll get into it, but really, I mean, gave Michael an opportunity to speak out and kind of highlighted him. And, you know, I know you have a lot of feelings about that and you did not participate in the 2020 correct. and you haven't even watched it at this point, correct? No, I won't watch it. Yeah. You, and you shouldn't. It's all pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did end up watching it to... I had to see for myself what they did. And I, I I knew that they had used a clip of mine and I was really disappointed in that. It did fall under fair use, so they were able to do that. And we're also going to be getting into the Missing Alyssa podcast, which you have never really publicly spoken about your experience with Atavia Zapala. Yeah. I mean, I've touched on it a few times and mostly not naming her. Yeah. Um, but I... Yeah. And it's so hard for me to talk about now because honestly, she still scares me because of the past interactions with her, but yeah. I'm going to do my best because it shaped my entire view of true crime. Mm -hmm. And once the arrest happened and I began talking about ethics and true crime, most of my experiences, negative experiences came from that podcast and just from interactions with her. So it's a little scary, but um, I think it's important to talk about because my side has never been out there. No. And she's put her side out there. Yeah. And I'm sure it's been hard to kind of hold your tongue on some of that. I didn't want to, you know, talk about it before the trial because it wasn't about me. You know what I mean? Yeah. All the focus needed to be on Alyssa. But yeah, she certainly told her side of the story. And, you know, and I, I know we can't get into everything today, nor should we. I don't want to really, but um, we'll, we'll do an overview and I'm ready to talk about it. We're going to be talking a lot about the trial, though, as well, and your experience with that, how you feel the trial was rushed and how certain media platforms have you know, really exploited your sister and possibly damaged the trial as well. And what Michael's freedom, your father's freedom looks like today and moving forward and how you want to, you know, approach things going forward and kind of your future goals. I'd love to get into all of that. 
But again, thank you so much for being here. We will be back with Sarah in a moment. And now we're going to cut back to my home studio where I will give a summary on the Alyssa Turney case. Okay, so back in my normal spot here. And before I jump into my interview with Sarah, I wanted to take a moment to summarize this case. Now, it's really hard to summarize the disappearance of Alyssa Turney because there is so much information So again, I will have some videos of mine, some podcasts linked below, as well as Sarah's podcast on the case. That is going to be the best source for information and a full picture. So please check that out. But I'm going to do my best to explain it for those of you who aren't familiar with Alyssa's story. Really quick, though, before I get into that, I reached out to my friends at National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and asked them if they could do an updated age progression of Alyssa with her 40th birthday coming up next year, and they said they would be happy to. This is the age progression that they already have available. They have been very helpful in this case, and it'll be great to get another one. Big thank you to NECMEC for getting that done so quickly for us. I know Sarah and I really appreciate it. And if you want to, I would be really grateful if you would share that image. I will have a link to it below where you can download it and you know put it on your social media or share it with friends and family. As of the recording of this video, we have raised $230,000 for NECMEC, and I am very, very grateful to all of you who have participated in the campaign. We have several merch items available right now. We have t-shirts, crewnecks, long sleeves. Some of the items we do have very limited quantities of, so if you would like one of them, get yours soon before we sell out. And 100% of the proceeds from that collection goes directly to NECMEC. If you would like to check any of those out, they're all available at my merch's new home, which is kendallray.shop. So let's go ahead and talk about Alyssa. Alyssa was born April 3rd, 1984, which means her 40th birthday is coming up next year, next April. She was born to her mother, Barbara, and her biological father wasn't in the picture. So when her mom met Michael Turney and the two got married, he quickly became the father figure in Alyssa's life. Michael had three sons from a previous relationship, and along with Alyssa, Barbara also had a son. And together, Michael and Barbara had one daughter of their own, Sarah. And despite technically being a blended family, Michael and Barbara really put an emphasis on the fact that they were one family, so nobody thought of each other as a half-sibling or anything like that. And that's why you'll hear Sarah refer to Alyssa as her sister and not her half-sister. By the time Alyssa and Sarah were through their early childhood, their brothers had moved out of the house, so it was really just the two of them, and that made them incredibly close. And sadly, when Sarah was just four years old and Alyssa was eight, their mother passed away from lung cancer, and so they were left in the care of Michael and Michael alone. And for as long as Sarah can remember, their father, Michael, treated them both very differently. And to Sarah, Michael was the perfect father. He let her skip school anytime she wanted. She could eat all the McDonald's in the world. She could drink beer and smoke cigarettes, pretty much do anything that any young kid would only dream of being able to do. And there's no reason why she would believe he was anything but the coolest dad ever. But within their household in Phoenix, Arizona, Alyssa was having a completely different experience. To Michael, Alyssa was a troublemaker, a moron, and incapable of doing anything right. And where Sarah was allowed to come and go as she pleased and have a lot of freedoms, Alyssa was heavily monitored and under very strict rules. So much so, and this may surprise you if you don't know anything about this case, but Michael actually hid surveillance cameras inside the house to keep an eye on Alyssa's every move. And this is very creepy and disturbing, but there was a camera hidden inside a vent in their living room that would capture moments, intimate moments between Alyssa and her boyfriend. And it didn't stop there. Michael also tapped her phone and recorded every single phone conversation that she had. It was every bit as bad as it probably sounds and honestly, probably worse. And to this day, Michael stands by his actions. He said that because she drank and experimented with weed and was basically a normal teenager, that she was troubled and needed his guidance. And there really wasn't any part of Alyssa's life that was truly her own. Even when she was in high school and got a job at Jack in the Box, Michael would stalk her to make sure that she was where she said she was. I mean, there was literally no trust. And I personally believe that Alyssa could have been, you know, the perfect child and Michael still would have treated her this way. And I say that because Sarah had a completely different experience, even though she was only a few years younger than her and 
doing technically the same bad things in Michael's eyes, Michael didn't care at all. He even encouraged it. And truth be told, Michael even convinced Sarah for a long time that her sister was, in fact, troubled. Sarah was manipulated to believe that Alyssa deserved these strict rules because she was bad and that she was treated better because she was good. And Sarah is the first to admit that she and Alyssa didn't always get along and she was kind of on her dad's side. They were sisters. I mean, I get it. I have a little sister and we're about the same age difference as the two of them. And sisters fight. They tattle tail and they make each other's lives harder than it needs to be. But looking back now, Sarah sees that all Alyssa was ever trying to do was protect her from their father. Protect her from the man that not only spied on her every word and every move, but also protect her from the man who was molesting her. To this day, Michael denies molesting Alyssa. And it can't be proven 100%. But if I'm being honest, in my opinion, his actions don't align with someone who is innocent. First of all, a year before Alyssa went missing, Michael himself called up CPS and told them, oh, by the way, if my daughter ever calls you guys to say I molested her, she's lying. Which, what innocent person does that? Second of all, he had Alyssa sign contracts, literal contracts, where she had to sign and confirm that he never molested her. I'm sorry, what? What father, what parent thinks of something like that, unless they are trying to protect themselves? But like I said, Michael denies these allegations. I also want to play you a short home video that Sarah recorded when she was a child that I think really puts everything into perspective. Not only does Alyssa say outright that Michael is a pervert, but you can see firsthand how he treated her and how he spoke to her. Hit the red button. Why? Hit the red button now. I don't want to. I don't record. Hit the red button. Yeah. I'm recording. Yeah, it's a pervert. Yes, sir. Give me the camera now. <laughs> and you're still recording. And Lissa is stupid moron. Alyssa would not have called Michael a pervert for no reason. And looking back, Sarah believes that this was her way of trying to protect her sister, trying to warn her about the type of person that their father was, the type of person that their father is. Now, I don't have time today to get into every single example of abuse that Alyssa endured, but there is a lot, and I encourage you to do further research on this case. But now I'm going to jump forward to May 17th, 2001, the last day Alyssa was seen. It was a Thursday, and it was the last day of school for students at Paradise Valley High School, where Alyssa was a junior. And the day was completely normal up until about 11 a.m. when Michael pulled Alyssa out of school early. And according to his version of events, which, mind you, didn't even become public to the family until years later, he pulled Alyssa out of school early to get lunch. Michael says that at this lunch, he and Alyssa got into a big argument about her freedom, or lack thereof. He claims that afterwards, he dropped her off at home, which is when she stormed off into her bedroom. That was the last time he saw her. And then he went out to go run some errands and then pick Sarah up from school. And by 5 p.m., when Sarah and Michael got home, Alyssa was gone. And it was actually Sarah who went into Alyssa's room and realized that something was wrong. Alyssa normally kept her room very neat, but there were things scattered out across her bed, and one of those items was a note. And this note says, Dad and Sarah, when you dropped me off at school today, I decided that I really am going to California. Sarah, you said you didn't want me around. Look, you got it. I'm gone. That's why I saved my money. Dad, I took $300 from you. Alyssa. Now I could go on and on about this note. There are many strange things about it. However, for the sake of time today, I just want to focus on one major concern when it comes to that note. That makes me, Sarah, and many others believe that something is off about it. Alyssa mentions taking $300 from her dad, but she had $1,800 saved up and she didn't take any of that. Now, that is a lot of money, especially back in 2001 for a teenager to have saved and it remained completely untouched. And if she were running away, you know for sure that she would have taken that money with her. But Alyssa's bank account was never accessed. Her social security number has never been used. Now, 
it is important to note that this note was written by Alyssa. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it was her handwriting, but there are several more things about it that make Sarah and others believe it was actually written weeks, if not months, before. And because Alyssa was only 17 and Michael, who was a former police officer, reported her as a runaway, the local authorities never did anything to search for her. Michael never made them believe that she was at risk. And I believe that this was intentional and strategic. I mean, it obviously would have looked bad if he had never reported her missing, but I think he did it in a way to make sure that police weren't worried. And after all, Alyssa did actually have an aunt living in California who she did at one point plan to move in with. But here's what's crazy. Even though Michael downplayed the whole thing to the police, at home, he was acting totally different. At home, he was freaking out. He was acting terrified. He was saying things like he knew something bad happened to her, that he knew she was dead. So just a completely different story than he was telling police. And Michael even said one week after Alyssa went missing, he got a mysterious phone call around 5 a.m. from someone who he believed was Alyssa. He said that the sound was muffled, but that she told him to leave her alone. Michael swears up and down that this call was from Alyssa. He even ended up suing the phone company to get access to records so he could prove that the call was real, that it really did come from a payphone in California, therefore proving somehow that Alyssa was still alive. But here's the thing, anyone could have made that call. In the days following Alyssa's disappearance, Michael made several trips out to California where he said he was looking for Alyssa. But Sarah and many others believe that he paid someone to make this call so he could have some type of proof that she was still alive. Also, think about it. For a man who records every phone call that he has and records with video everything that happens in the home, it's very interesting that he has no recording of that call. Out of years and years of recording every single phone call that came into that house, that was the one day, the one call that he says his recording device wasn't working. And not just that, but think about the home surveillance footage too. You would think the first thing he would do is turn in the home surveillance footage from the day she disappeared to the police, but he didn't. Instead, he says that he looked through them himself and found, quote, nothing of value. Now, by the time that police did end up getting all their surveillance footage, there was no recordings on the day of May 17th, 2001. Convenient. Now, moving forward a little, I want to talk about Sarah's relationship with her father during all of this. Because for many years, she actually stood by his side and supported him despite rumors that he had something to do with Alyssa's disappearance. And I mean, just try to put yourself in her shoes. Imagine your father, the man that you love, the man who gave you everything, was being accused of murdering your sister. You wouldn't want to believe it. You would try to convince yourself that it wasn't true. And that's what Sarah did. She believed her father was innocent because she couldn't imagine there was any world in which he wasn't. And it really wasn't until after the first 2020 special came out that she started to realize the very sad truth that her father was likely the person responsible for what happened to her sister. But before I talk about 2020, there is one major thing that I need to recap for you guys before we move forward, and that is the raid of Michael Turney's home in 2008. This raid, which happened in December of that year, was supposed to be a search in connection with the disappearance of Alyssa. However, what they ended up finding was something much different. In Michael's home, police found 19 high-caliber assault rifles, two handmade silencers, a van full of gasoline cans, and 26 pipe bombs filled with gunpowder and roofing nails. And on top of that, they found a manifesto called Diary of a Madman Martyr, where he outlined his plan to avenge Alyssa's death and kill two men from the union who he says were responsible for killing Alyssa. Michael was arrested and eventually pleaded guilty to possessing 26 unregistered pipe bombs and was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. He was sentenced in 2010 and only served seven of those 10 years. Next, I want to quickly talk about the first 2020 special that aired. And many of you probably heard of Alyssa's story through the 2020 special. And if you did, you might remember that Sarah defended her father during it. I want to make it extremely clear that this is not how she feels now. She has totally changed her mind on the situation. And I want to let you know that she felt and continues to feel exploited and unsupported 
by the makers of that show. Not once had they actually put in any effort to search for Alyssa's remains. There has been no search ever done. Not only that, but they have time after time given Michael a platform to speak out about his innocence. And this just feels very wrong to her. This is something that her and I talk about in detail in our interview because recently they aired a second special on the case. And there is a lot to be said about that. But now let's talk about what happened recently, the trial and Michael's acquittal. If you have been following Lissa's case over the years and you've followed Sarah's journey, you know that all she wants is justice for her sister. Nothing is going to change what happened, but seeing her father be held accountable and behind bars for what she believes he did to her sister would give her some type of peace. So in August of 2020, Michael was arrested. This was such an exciting time. It was a huge victory for Sarah after all the work that she's put in. I mean, she has really led this fight. He was charged with second degree murder and it kind of felt like there was a light at the end of the tunnel. But like many of you probably already know, it didn't go the way that any of us hoped. In July of this year, Michael Turney was acquitted of his charges after five days of testimony presented by the prosecution. The defense never even presented their case. They filed what is known as a motion for acquittal basically meaning that they wanted the judge to acquit him because the state didn't present sufficient evidence to support the charges at hand. And the judge agreed, which allowed Michael to walk away as a free man. And when this happened, I can't even tell you how shocked I was. And you'll hear Sarah say during our interview that the judge ultimately made the right decision, even though it wasn't the decision she wanted. The state truly failed Sarah. They failed Alyssa. And it's all because they weren't prepared to take this case to trial, but they did it anyway. Sarah was left completely in the dark since the day her father was arrested and was only given three opportunities to speak with the people representing her sister's case. And during those meetings, she was even told that another case they were working on took higher priority. And because they didn't know her case and because they didn't give it the attention it deserved, Michael is a free man today. It's extremely frustrating to see he has created a YouTube channel now He's been given opportunities like the 2020 to have a platform and be the victim. But through all of this, I have just been amazed by Sarah's strength. She is truly one of the strongest people I know. I am so honored that she wanted to come on my show. I'm honored to call her one of my friends. She is really one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And without further ado, let's hop into our interview. Okay. And we're back in the studio with Sarah. So we aren't going to be retelling the entire story from start to finish, obviously, because we've done that before. Um, But there are a lot of things that happened recently that I'd like to get into and and hear your experience. So starting off with your father, Michael Turney, was arrested in August 2020 and charged with second degree murder of your sister. What was that experience like for you when the arrest happened? Oh, insane. I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, you know, I, I got a call basically from Detective Anderson, who I love. He's absolutely wonderful. And mm-hmm. he was kind of like, you know, we arrested your dad and, you know, you did it, kid. And it was this like beautiful, and I have the audio that I can't wait to play someday, but it was this like beautiful full circle moment because it, you know, the Phoenix PD never really confirmed their meeting with me where they told me to get media. They've always really kind of shied away from that part, um, which I I do understand why. And so there was always this tension of like, are they mad at me? Like, I don't really understand because there's not a lot of transparency there. And then we had that call and it was like, okay, yes, like everything was confirmed. That's exactly what they wanted me to do, just like they told me in that meeting. And, you know, Detective Anderson really watched me grow up. You know, he met me when I was like 17. And and so it was a really cool moment. And I mean, obviously I was in shock, right? I didn't know what to do. Um, I like ran to like post that update because I was like, what do I do? I, you know, I, I really, and I did, I wanted to be the person to break the story. Mm -hmm. I was like, I want to tell everybody that like we did it, you know, because it was this huge collective effort in my mind between, you know, hundreds of thousands, I mean, a million people on TikTok or whatever Mm -hmm. fighting for Alyssa. And so I just wanted people to know like we did it, like this movement, this whole media thing really can work um, and at least push things forward and get it into the public eye and get more resources on it. So I was I mean, I was shocked. I was terrified. I was confused. After a certain point, you know, honestly, some guilt set in. It's a really conflicting feeling to one, be like, yes, Alyssa's finally getting justice. And then two, be like, but that's my dad. And I did play a role in putting him in jail. And 
even, you know, I think he's a monster and I know that he's not a good person, but as my dad, it's still really, you know, I had a lot of conflicting feelings. It's a hard, weird thing to deal with. Because when you were growing up, you were very close with your dad and really thought the world of him. You know, you had all these freedoms and he was the cool dad. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the experience for Alyssa, but I'm sure there, I mean, it's only natural for you to have moments where you feel like some type of guilt. Yeah. Well, and you know, our mom died when we were little. I was four and Alyssa was about eight. And you know, then Alyssa was gone when I was 12. And Alyssa very much played that mother role for me. Yeah. And then it was just me and my dad. And you know, he didn't work. I didn't have to go to school. And so we spent a lot of time together. We would go to the movies and, you know, he would buy me scratcher tickets. And Mm -hmm. um, I really did think that he was that cool dad. Um, When when I got older, you know, if I was stuck at a party, he'd come give me a ride home, no questions asked. What I didn't understand was that um, it wasn't love. You know what I mean? He was really just trying to, in my mind, distract me from everything. You know, he gave me the master bedroom. He let me have a mini fridge that he filled with beer for me and my friends. And I thought that was love. And now that I'm an adult and I care for children in my life, I'm like, that's that's not love. Yeah, a lot of emotions throughout this whole thing, obviously. And your last conversation with him before the arrest, was it when you had called him? And I believe you were at a Starbucks. So I actually, the last time I ever spoke with him was the first call I play on Voices for Justice. And yes. that was in 2019 after CrimeCon. Because funny enough, uh, 2020 wanted to have him back on, but they would only do it if he would interview. And so I was like, hey, like, this is a great chance to get Alyssa's story out there. You say you want to work for her. You say that you want to find her. Please come do this show with me. And that phone call ends with him basically hanging up on me and saying that he won't do it. Um, But that was the last time I spoke to him. Previously, I did meet with him at a Starbucks in person right? Okay, to get that face-to-face. And that's where he said, come to my deathbed and I'll give you all the honest answers you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And he also said that he would confess if uh, the state gave him lethal injection within 10 days of the confession. And they did not allow that to be part of the trial, correct? No. So what happened was the state fought for that audio to make it in and they won and they never used it. Right. Okay. They never used that it. That is so frustrating. Well, and what's even more frustrating is the defense brought it up and opened that door for them. The mm-hmm. defense started grilling me about it. They were like, and in that conversation, your father says that he didn't do it, right? He repeatedly told you he didn't do it. And I, I, I ended up telling Jamie Jackson, I was like, just play the audio. Why are we debating about it? The audio is admissible. Just play it. It's mm-hmm. not what I think about it or what you think about it. Let the jury hear it. Just hear it. Let the judge hear it. Mm-hmm. And they Just never used it. Allow it. Yeah. Wow. That's incredibly frustrating. And did he ever reach out to you after the arrest? My father? Yeah. Uh, no. Not once. No. Okay. He never made an attempt to contact you or like put out a public statement or anything like that? No, only now does he do media and talk about how he loves me and while secretly commenting online terrible things about me. So no, he's never reached out, not personally. Can you explain to anyone that might be confused sort of where things went wrong with the trial in your experience and maybe talk more about your experience with the trial, you know, from start to finish, kind of what that was like? Sure, it was very bittersweet, intense. It was the worst is the only way I can put it. A lot of it was because I was alone. I went to every court hearing by myself, which was really hard. I was lucky enough to have um, Defenders of Children, a local Arizona nonprofit, help me. They reached out and said, you're going to want a victim's rights attorney. And they were extremely correct about that. So I had a wonderful gentleman named David Newstone who was with me the entire time and explained everything. And without him, I would have fallen to pieces. I mean, There's no other way to describe it other than traumatic from start to finish. And it became very clear that my father and his defense team were specifically targeting me. And I'm not just saying that. I didn't feel picked on. That's what my lawyer told me. That's what the state told me. That's very obvious. Um, Yeah. I mean, one of the first motions they filed was to take down my podcast, take down all my social media, take down everything I've ever done. And, you know, on the flip side, they didn't ask for the Missing Alyssa podcast to be taken down. It was or any other content. It was just me. And they repeatedly filed motions. You know, my I, luckily I had Defenders of Children and we fought back and, you know, I have a right to free speech. And so I did win that. Um, I was never legally not allowed to talk about the case. I was advised that it was in Alyssa's best interest to stay quiet during the trial. So that's why I did that. They were filing motions. And citing videos on TikTok, I made about other cases. And my lawyer was like, you can't prevent 
her entire career what she's doing now. She has a right to talk about this. So we won that. The next fight was um, they tried to say that I was an agent of the police, that I was working what? with police to get him arrested and to... They cited the 2017 Starbucks meeting, and they tried to say that I was directly uh, <laughs> commanded like by to police do to do it, Yeah, wow. which is not the case. No. And I went to police, and I was like, mic me up. Put me undercover. Like, let's do this. And they were like, that's not how this works. We can't do that. So they tried to fight that I was an agent of the state, that I was working with the state and the police. And I'm like, after the police gave me such a hard time, like, how can anybody believe that? Um, but of course, the judge also said, we don't believe that. I don't believe Sarah acted as an agent of the state in any capacity, and we won that fight because they were trying to keep that audio out. That was the big thing. There's a huge fight about that audio because it's so damning, mm -hmm. which is why it's so upsetting that they didn't use it. And then I, I've i never talked about this. This is br brand new information. What happened as a part of the trial, too, is the man who confessed to killing Alyssa that did the false confession, Thomas Heimer. Thomas, yeah. He reached out to me during the trial. And, he did. Mm -hmm, and wow. he, he wrote me a letter and he called me almost every single day. And I, at one point, asked the state if I could block his number. And they said, no, you cannot block his number right now. Just let him call you. Don't answer. So every day I was sitting there watching these calls come from this Tennessee prison and just like crying my eyes out. Um, because in his letter, he wrote that he had information that he would only tell me. So the defense then flipped that and said, Sarah is working with Thomas Heimer to frame Michael Turney. Oh, my God. So it was like I was an agent in the state. I was working with Thomas Heimer to, like, do something shady. It was every – Working with Thomas Heimer. How they, insane. Exactly. They attacked me on all fronts. So, like, of course, I never responded to that letter. I, like – whenever I get things in Alyssa's case, it's, like, hot potato. I'm like, I don't want it. You take it. Yeah. Like, you're – the police, the state, you know, during the trial – I don't want it. And of course, we won that fight too. Yeah. Because it's ridiculous. Yeah. And for um, those of you who don't know, Thomas Heimer, he had claimed to have killed Alyssa at one point. And, you know, they brought him in for questioning and they started bringing up pictures of her because all he had was the age progressed picture of her. Yes. And so when he saw actual pictures of her, he said, I wouldn't have picked her in a lineup. And I don't think, you know, he totally backtracked on that. He had also claimed to have killed JC Dugard. Yeah. And that was before she was recovered. So, you know, he's not a credible source in any way. Exactly. I mean, he flip-flopped a lot back and forth. We weren't sure if he was going to come testify. Mm -hmm. And eventually he told people something like, and not verbatim, nobody quote me, like I don't remember, I don't have the court docs in front of me. Um, but it was something like, if they try to get me to testify in this trial, I'm going to start stabbing everyone I see. Oh my God. Like it was just, it was so intense and so drama filled and it was so annoying to be honest because it's all drama and it's all fluff and it wasn't it, nobody was focusing on the facts of the case because all these things started coming up right thomas yeah. heimer mm -hmm. all the media stuff um somebody even called in and claimed that um Alyssa was alive in some other state and that i knew about it and was framing my dad and so they had to go like give this woman a dna test it wasn't Alyssa, of course it was so traumatizing because it was just one thing after the other and it was mostly directed at me and it mm -hmm. like you know, I never chose to be a part of this. I mean, of course, I made this choice when the police told me to get media, but I did that at their prompting. You know what I mean? It's I never wanted to be this like public figure or yeah. front facing like this. And, and did you really ever have a choice? I mean, she's your sister. Yeah. What else are you going to do? Right. And no, I didn't feel like I had a choice. And, you know, I, and no shade to my brothers, but nobody else was stepping up. It had to be me. Mm -hmm. Nobody else was willing to do it. Yeah. And, and it's... That's come with so much trauma for you to deal with. And it's it's truly amazing to me how well you've handled all of that, especially having someone like Tom Heimer calling you. That's got to feel terrifying. Yeah, it was. And he has, you know, my home address because I wrote him years ago for the podcast because believe it or not, I really was trying to make it, you know, as unbiased as possible. And so I wanted his take on it. We never ended up connecting. Um, we wrote a few letters, but we never had this like formal interview that I was going for. Oh. But he knew my address. Um, and so, yeah, getting getting the letter in the mail. And, you know, eventually they did allow me to block the number. So that was good. But just hearing the voicemails every day and waking <sighs> up to like five missed calls from Tennessee or whatever, wow. there was no escape. And again, being the only family member really involved in the trial process, that was all me, reviewing the motions, getting the motions every day almost, answering questions. But yeah, it was, I mean, I, I always describe it as just unbearable because it was, it was unbearable. What was the first day in court like? 
Well, I mean, it was easier when it was just like motions, right? Because I showed up for everything, yeah. every single thing. I was mm -hmm. not – because I didn't want Alyssa to be unrepresented. The thought of nobody being there for her just like shattered my heart. And yeah. I kept thinking of her like she would never let me be alone ever. And she didn't. And that's why she stayed. So it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And when the trial started – um, it was just even worse. And most of the times I just, I sat there and just cried the whole time. During the trial? Oh yeah. Especially when it was just, you know, things about her memory and even, even the second when they were like, you know, Michael Turney or being, you know, a charge of second degree murder. I just, I just lost it. It's hard. It's hard to hear. No matter how much I think he did it and no matter how much I think he's a monster, it still just hurts. Of course. What was it like seeing him in the courtroom? Awful. Um, I was not supposed to look at him, so I didn't. Um, but the first time that we were in court together, I was told that he was glaring at me the entire time. And there was one point where my lawyer actually called for, um, I forget what it's, what it's called, but it's when all the lawyers and the judge go in like a back room to talk about something. And so it was just me and my dad in the courtroom. And there might have been, uh, maybe somebody from the media, I can't remember, but he started speaking into the microphone about his innocence. And, um, my lawyer came out and, you know, he was like, you know that he's just trying to rile you up. You know that he's just talking to you, right? And again, it was so helpful to have the lawyer there because I'm just full of emotions. I'm not sure how to process things. Yeah. But he was like, he's doing, he's trying to torment you. Don't let it get to you. That would be so hard. I don't know how you were able to do that. I mean, you're so focused on the mission that, you know, you were able to find that strength. But it, it that's hard. I don't think that's something that many people could could do. In my mind, it was like, it was so black and white. It's not about me. It's about Alyssa. It's not about me. It's about Alyssa. And that's really what kept me going. You know, what's the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. So black and white for me. And that's one thing I've always really respected about you too, is you've always been so focused on that from the beginning, that it's about Alyssa first and that, you know, protecting her, protecting the story, that always is your first priority. Mm -hmm. What was the moment during the trial where you started to feel like maybe – this isn't going to go the way that I'm hoping it's going to go. So, I mean, if I'm honest, I had my suspicions early on when they just weren't interested in talking to me. And I shouldn't say not interested. They kept pushing it off. So what happened was um, right before Alyssa's trial, my same prosecutor was trying the Brian Patrick Miller case. You know, they kept telling me, we have that case to worry about. We'll get to you when we can. We have that mm -hmm. case to worry about. Mm -hmm. And so I kept asking my lawyer, I was like, I don't feel like it's a priority. And he's like, you know, it's just kind of the way that these things go. And early on, I gave them um, my outline. Actually, I have this like 200 page document where I outlined the entire case file. Wow. So I'm just like this. 200 pages. It's insane. I mean, I had documented everything I could just because I, I have a terrible memory and I can't keep that in my mind. And I wanted them to just have everything. And of course, I was like, you don't have to listen to me. I understand if you think it's biased, you know, but here's my outline. And as we got closer and closer to trial and they were done with the Brian Patrick Miller case, it became very clear that they just weren't familiar with the case. Um, mm -hmm. In one of the last meetings we had, they were asking me questions that I had submitted to them three years prior. And um, the most, which is, you know, I get it. If they're busy and they, you know, maybe that's what they do, right? Maybe they can get up to speed on a case in a few weeks. I don't know. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not an expert. Of course, I had my suspicions. Doesn't sound right. But what I kept being told in that last meeting or whatever meeting it was close to the end was that would be great, but it's too late to admit that now. And these are things that I told them three years ago. Things like uh, my father's past history of sexually abusing family members. All these women came forward to talk about it and have spoken about it. And they were like, well, that would have been great, but it's too late now. And I'm like, I told you this three years ago. What are you talking about? Oh my God, that's got to be so frustrating. It was awful. You know, and they kept asking really rudimentary questions. The first time that they told my story about um, what I said happened on the day Alyssa went missing, they actually just pulled like a local newspaper article and cited that. And I was like, all of this is wrong. Like this says that I walked like 10 miles home, which is not correct, just inaccuracies. And I'm like, you know, why would you choose to pull this? And they're like, well, it's not important. Don't worry about it. And I think I sent you a text where um, they asked for pictures of Alyssa. And I guess you did tell me about this. Yeah. Can we please talk about that? Yeah. I uploaded a bunch to Google Drive because they asked, you know what I mean? They, we want to bring her to life and show how wonderful she was. So of course, I'm like, here's all these pictures. And then I get this email and I don't think they meant to kind of forward it to me. It was like in a chain. 
Um, because the you know the prosecutor is very old. I believe he's in his eighties, and you know he mm. he had problems with technology. I'm not trying to like age him yeah. or whatever, but throughout the entire trial, he had problems with technology. So I I have to believe this was an accident. I, I hope it was. And, yeah, let's hope. It basically said the person who was pulling the pictures was like, well, I found these two, and I didn't want to dig any deeper. <laughs> And they were the worst pictures of Alyssa. Like, one was literally just, like, degraded quality. Like, the picture was, like, all scratched up, the one of her and her friends. And then one, she looked like she was, like, it was a prom photo, but her eyes were all weird. And we knew that they were going to attack her character. And I was, like, she looks, like, high in this photo. Like, can we use any other photo? And they never used the photos I sent to them. Um, They just used those two. Even the night before trial, I'll never forget. I was obviously just trying to, like, chill and go to bed early and, like stay in a calm place and um, I get a call and they're like, how late are you staying up tonight? I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, they want to ask you questions. They're just wondering like what time you're going to bed, what time they can call you until to ask these questions. And the questions were like, what's the family structure? Like who, which brother has which parent? And it's like, it was like doing Alyssa 101 right before the trial and they were like cramming and even in that last meeting, he said, it's it's not looking good. It's not looking good. It kind of set me up, I think, to lose. And I looked at him and I said, why'd you even take this case? And he kind of, in, in my opinion, kind of got a little flustered and was like, I wouldn't have taken this case if I didn't think we could win. And I, yeah, I was not confident going into that trial because I knew that they didn't know this case. They seemed so unorganized. I mean, to be asking about the family structure right before, that's just like, the absolute basics. And there's so much information out there that they easily could have put that together themselves. And the defense knew. The defense, uh, they did a great job. Really? As much as I don't enjoy them personally and I don't understand how they can, you know, say what they said about my sister, they did their homework and it showed. What were some of the things they said about your sister that were upsetting to you? Everything. I mean, it was just a smear campaign against her. Mm -hmm. I've never seen such vile words about a 17-year-old, even on Reddit about Alyssa or, you know, I mean, my God, nobody has framed her in that way. And they just tried to make her out to be this terrible, wild kid who didn't care about anybody or anything. And it's just not the truth. And um, unfortunately, you know, my family was fighting for, you know, at the end, my brothers did kind of come in. I, I, long story, I begged them. I, I started crying and I was like, they're keeping me out of the trial. They're telling me that they have to keep me in the dark and that they can't tell me anything that's going on because of how harshly dad's team has attacked me. And I'm like literally sobbing to them, like somebody has to step in. It has to be somebody that's not me. And nobody would help me until the final, like the end. So my brother comes in, you know, and it's just not the way things work. And he's like, we need an expert. We need somebody to explain why Alyssa acted this way. And I wish I'd thought of it because it's a great idea. You know what I mean? I just... I was told to sit back and let the state do what they're going to do. I don't get to tell them what to do, which is true. So I would have loved an expert to come in and talk about perhaps why she was displaying those behaviors. I mean, for my work with kids in foster care, she was showing clear signs of trauma and abuse. So the way they painted her was awful. You know, in one motion, one of the most traumatic motions, I had to basically read an argument about how they thought Alyssa didn't love me, like love me enough to stay. Like it was, it was awful. It's a shame, though, that the state didn't match their level of preparation. It's just such a failure. Yeah. Well, and and that's the thing is, you know, I agree that with the judge that the state did not present their case. My argument is they could have. There were so many things that were admissible that never made it in. Um, and that's the most frustrating part, the what ifs. You know, they and they kept telling us, when we get to closing arguments, we're going to bring all that up. Um, you know, we'll put you back on the stand if we need to. And none of that happened. What were some of the things that were admissible that they just completely ignored? So the big thing was, um, well, there's lots of big things, I guess, but um, they basically cut the witness list like in half. Like two of my brothers didn't testify. A lot of her friends didn't testify. My cousin who saw the video, who says he saw the video of um, Alyssa nude on film with a friend, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I think they just like couldn't find him up north in northern Arizona and just kind of left it at that. Like they never went to like visit or like, so they just dropped it. So half the witness list never even made it to trial. They just kept cutting witnesses left and right. You know, even one of her closest friends, Katie, um, was never called to testify and she was shocked, you know. And was she willing to? Oh, absolutely. Everybody was so willing to talk for Alyssa. Yeah, they just cut that witness list in half, which 
It was never really explained to me. So many of the stories my dad told about what happened to Alyssa also never made it to trial. Like he gave John, Alyssa's ex-boyfriend or whatever her boyfriend at the time, he gave her a number and said, Alyssa's at her aunt's house. You can call her here. And he, I guess, called and called and called. And I don't know what number it was. Maybe it was a payphone or something. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my aunt's number. Like, But that poor guy just thinking that Alyssa hated him and left. I mean, the same with me, right? Mm -hmm. My dad Mm -hmm. said, you know, Alyssa left. Alyssa left you guys. So they actually prepared my brother James to talk about this walk that he went on with Alyssa where she was describing the abuse that happened in the house. And they never went forward with that. They never asked him about that which blows my mind. I know that there's hearsay issues and I'm not an expert, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but that was the plan. You know what I mean? So we were kind of left like, why are you leaving these things out? Nothing was explained to us. Um, You know, I talked about the audio of my dad saying that he would confess, saying, you know, come to the deathbed and I'll give you all the honest answers you want to hear. Yeah. I was waiting for that. I think it's one of the most damning pieces of evidence in this case. Yeah. Can you explain that more for people who aren't familiar with that part of the story? Yeah. So in 2017, my father got out of prison for his pipe bomb charges for being a literal domestic terrorist Mm -hmm. and wanting to kill multiple people. And so I'd never spoken to him outside of a prison line in so long, right? Because all calls in prison are recorded. And so I was like, I'm going to meet him in person where there's no security guards. There's nobody watching. I mean, I was recording. And unfortunately Mm -hmm. for him, he taught me that Arizona is a one-party consent state with recording. So that's on him. Mm -hmm. Um, And my phone was right there. If he didn't know I was recording, I would be shocked. But I just sat him down and was like, let's talk about it. You know what I mean? And we get to this point in the conversation. He's like, you really think I did it? I'm like, yeah, I do. I was like, what other explanation is there? Like, you've never given me a straight answer. And the whole time he's just like taunting me and being a total jerk. And this is who he really is. You know what I mean? This is the real him, not what people see in interviews and on camera Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. his now YouTube channel. And he, you know, he says, come to the deathbed and I'll give you all the honest answers you want to hear. And then later in the conversation, he says, you know, Sarah, I'd admit to anything if the state agreed to give me lethal injection within 10 days. And I was like, okay, do it. And he's like, really, really, you want me to die or whatever? And I was like... I I want the truth. You know what I mean? And uh, he was like, so you want me to confess to something I didn't do? And I was like, I didn't say something you didn't do. So I think it was a really telling interview. You know, most of the time he just disparages Alyssa in it. And you can just tell he's so cold. And, you know, he even uh, even said something like, oh, yeah, because you and Alyssa were that close, huh? Mm. Like, that was my only mom. Like, of course we were. You you were the adult letting her – do my birthday parties and creating Christmas for me. You think we weren't close? Like, give me a break. It's just a way to hurt you. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So that's the context behind that audio. And of course, I wanted that to play. Um, And I would have loved for that other conversation where he refused to do media too. You know what I mean? Like, I already talked about the other victims, right? Being told it was too late. And um, there was actually a woman that came forward in the last days before trial and said, he assaulted me. I want to talk about it. And they were like, it's too late. We can't admit it. And I, I don't, you know, I can't vouch for the rules of court. They know better than I do. But as just a normal person in common sense, it's just like so frustrating. And that's the justice system is about legalities and about rules of law. It's not always about the truth or common sense. And that's mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. hurts so much. Oh, there was also, so I found this video. So one of the parts that the defense was trying to say, you know, they were talking about all these hidden cameras because there were allegations that there were hidden cameras in Alyssa's room. Yes. Which I believe. And they said, well, there was no red light. There was no red light. So there couldn't have been a camera. And I, you know, I said, my dad covered it. He would put black electrical tape over the red lights that, you know, show that you're recording on it, mm-hmm. especially like an old school camera, like in the 90s oh, yeah. or whatever. Yep. And I actually, through finding, trying to find images of Alyssa for the court, I found this little piece of a video. And it's Alyssa's friends and her jumping from the trampoline into our pool. And her friends are like, I don't want to be recorded. And it's re- obviously, it's recording. Alyssa looks at the camera and says, look, there's no red light. He's not recording. It's fine. And that's because he covered the light. And so I was like, why didn't we use that to contest those points? They also didn't use the interview from my father's ex-girlfriend, Alyssa's teacher, who Alyssa said, I'm having sex with my dad, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is insane. It's a police document. Why can't we talk about it? I can't believe they didn't use that. Mm -hmm. There was also – so for the first time ever, a girl named Shay grew up next to us. And we were like – we were kind of all three sisters. Like she was right in between age-wise between me and Alyssa. Mm -hmm. And she saw everything. And um, 
they decided that they wouldn't admit two of her stories because they were too old. Um, these stories of her seeing abuse. But there was one where the judge was like, I would probably admit that for you to the state. And it was about Shay seeing our father push Alyssa against a wall really aggressively and scream at her for kissing boys. And she was probably like 14 or 15, maybe. And the state was like, no, we're not going to fight for that. It's okay, judge. We don't need to use that. Why, why do you think they did that? I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say for sure. I think the bottom line is they did not know this case well enough. You know what I mean? They probably didn't even know how close right. Shay was to the family. And how much time did they actually have to prep? I mean, after the Brian Patrick Miller trial, I mean, maybe weeks. I don't remember the exact timeline, but, you know, I was told everything was being pushed off for that trial. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess maybe not long. In my mind, I would think the whole three years, right? That's I mean, what I'm saying. But yeah, I mean, it, you know, I basically got the call and it was like the Brian Patrick Miller trial's over. We're going to start gearing up. And it was just a few weeks before. Has this whole experience made you feel less confident in the justice system overall? Yes. I'm sure that's a dumb question, obviously, but. Not a dumb question. Yeah, it absolutely does. And it's scary, right? I even spoke to the prosecutor and I was like, what does it take for a 17-year-old girl to get justice for being abused? Yeah. She told teachers, she told friends, she told a family, she told adults in her life, you know, and she was so threatened to not go to CPS or the police, you know, because our dad would tell us, you're going to be split up. And so I'm like, does it literally take a child having to go to the police to get justice? Like they can't confide in their teachers yeah. or it, it just, yeah, it, it's insane. So I, I, yeah, absolutely. I have a big lack of faith in the justice system now. What was testifying like? Scary. I mean, it, it, you know, I was, I didn't get any prep really. You know, I did ask like, should I be looking at you? Should I be looking at the jury? Like, and they were like, just do what comes natural. And the biggest thing they told me is don't fight with the defense. Do not get argumentative with the defense. And they actually told me that one of their strategies, like the only thing they told me about was they said, if the defense begins to attack you, we are not going to step in because we think it'll make it look better for the jury. We think the jury will side with you the more they attack you. But it, it was awful. And Jamie Jackson just went after me like crazy. I, I think the most frustrating thing, and this is the only, really the only time where I started to speak back was when he kept saying that I was lying. You know what I mean? Like, because my 2008, I think it was 2008 interview with police is all based on information I gathered from when I was 12. And the police never really re-interviewed me. Their interviews are from like 2008 based on information when I was a child. And so, of course, things have changed now that I'm almost 35. You know what I mean? Like, of course, my perception has. I think anybody looking back on their parents from age 12 to now, of course, you see things so differently. Yes. yes. Um, and of course, that's where that famous line, uh, were you lying then? Or are you lying now? Screaming in my face. It was terrible. I don't like confrontation. And that's when I said I was brainwashed. And that's true. That's how me and my siblings feel. Yeah. My brother James even, you know, he likens it to a cult. He says, we are in the cult of Michael Turney. And looking back, that's really what it feels like. So, I mean, I knew I was going to be attacked, um, but it was, it was terrible. Did you have some like coping mechanisms or ways that you would try to deal with all this when you went home? Like, how did you not? I mean, I just trying to stay calm. You know, if I'm honest, I went home and watched the coverage every day and I was looking at what people were saying. I just, I wanted to know what the perception was. And it was the same Thing I felt, which was, what is the prosecution doing? What is the state doing? What is happening? I was fortunate enough that uh, my fiance's family surrounded me with love. And oh, that's great. That was everything. I, I literally was like, no, it's fine. Nobody needs to come. And they were like, you don't have a choice. We're going to surround you with love because you will forever say that you're fine and you're not fine. And we want right. to be there for you. I know I'm like getting choked up, but um, so I, was, I, I look back and I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful that you had that. Yeah. It's, it's so crucial. So let's let's talk about the day of the acquittal and what that was like. When you went into court that day, did you have any idea that that was going to happen? No. We did believe that the state was going to rest their case, even though my brother and I, my brother James and I, were like, put us back on the stand. You said that we were going to talk about all these things. We didn't talk about them. And they didn't want to do that. So we just thought that they were going to rest their case um, and you know present closing arguments or whatever. And then all of a sudden, they they do it. And, you know, the defense had filed many motions for a mistrial at this point. And so I was like, it's not going to happen. It hasn't happened the last, like, four times or whatever. 
And then it did. And if I'm being honest, I didn't really know what it meant. I turned to my lawyer. I was like, is it over? And he was like, yeah. So we go back to this room with my lawyer and my brothers. And I was like, you know, what happened? And he's like, yeah, it's, this means that it's over and your dad's free. He is going to be released today. And that, God. yeah, it was, it was just, I, I think I was just in shock. I like, I'm getting teary eyed now, but I don't think I've ever cried over that part yet. It's hard because I, going from what happened with police and them waiting so long to investigate and then this investigation to finally happen and them say, we know who did it. Too bad we can't do anything. Get media. Finally goes to trial and then too bad they didn't present their case well enough. I think I was cold and I was in shock and I wasn't ready to deal with it. Yeah, I, can't, I really can't imagine how truly shocking and heartbreaking that moment must have been for all of you. Yeah. Can you explain to the audience what the acquittal meant and what, I mean, what is an acquittal for those who don't know? Yeah. So basically the case was thrown out. It was due to the state not presenting their case. I mean, in the 2020, they said it was because of lack of evidence. Right. And maybe I'm wrong. This is the way it was explained to me. The state yeah. did not present their case, so they had to acquit. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I mean, I guess you could translate that to a lack of evidence yeah. presented at the mm -hmm. trial. I guess it's hard for me to admit like a lack of evidence because I just don't see it Lack that of way. evidence presented is what yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Obviously, there's a mountain of evidence against your dad, but they didn't they didn't bring out what they needed to and right. But he wasn't like found innocent. That was not a thing. It never no. went to it never went to the jury. Yeah. And from what I saw with the jury, I mean they were taking copious notes. They were, you know, shaking yeah. their heads. They were disgusted by a lot of it. You could yeah. tell. At least that was my interpretation of their faces. So yeah, I mean it means that it, it's it's over basically. You know, and I'm I am consulting with some people to figure out what the next steps are and I don't want to give out everything because mm -hmm. I fully believe my father is, you know, watching everything I do and I don't want him to kind of know. Is. Yeah, of course he is. I don't want him to to know the next steps, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know, it's it's pretty much over unless they're able to bring up maybe some different charges if perhaps Alyssa's body is found in another state, there could be something he could be charged with there. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, it, it's over. He's free. Do you think if he wasn't acquitted and things had moved forward that he would have been found guilty? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that jury knew. And, you know, if I'm being totally honest, the jury was mostly women. And I was like so excited for that because yeah. and no, no shade against men or whatever. But I think most women know, you know, some story of abuse, right? Either yes. they were sexually abused or harassed or know someone who was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and again, from looking at their faces, I could tell that, you know, that they just saw what was right in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, we weren't allowed to really talk about the sexual abuse allegations, but they were there. Yeah. And they were, you know, it, it was very clear to read between those lines. What do you want people to take away from the trial? Because I know a lot of people followed it. You know, a lot of it was made public. Is there something that you want people to learn from this experience or, you know, just to take away overall? Yeah. I mean, I think first, the justice system isn't always indicative of the truth. It's indicative of who has a better lawyer and who can better play the laws, really, you know, and not in every case, but certainly in this one. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things when I realized my dad was acquitted was I thought about the families and all those families fighting out there, and I didn't want them to be discouraged, you know. I still believe him getting to court was a huge win. And even if we didn't get it past the finish line, I just want families to realize that there is so much power in media attention and getting those resources that come with media attention, right? When police departments and states or, you know, state prosecutors are kind of put on the spot of like, this case is everywhere. What are you going to do? More resources are allocated to those cases. So I, I want families to know that just because, you know, my dad wasn't found guilty, that it it's not all for nothing and that they need to keep fighting. In my mind, it's like we, many of these families, we know the truth of what happened. We know all the things that don't make it to court, that don't make it to police reports even. Yeah, yeah. So it's really like keep fighting. Don't be discouraged. That's what I want people to know. Yeah. I know that was something that you were really concerned about in the beginning, that this could discourage other families and afraid to take on the legal system because it can be scary. And it did. I saw a video of a family that was like, I'm so disappointed with this outcome and it makes me worry about my family's outcome. And I think that that's really hard to see. Well, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you've inspired so many of these families to at least the fact that you got there, you know, and you were able to stand up there and testify and it wasn't easy, but you were able to do it. And I think you've inspired so many more people and that fear is valid. 
but I, I don't think it will discourage people from seeking justice. You know, this is just one case and unfortunately it was handled terribly. They weren't prepared. They didn't take it seriously. And that's not always the case, you know? So, yeah. There are so many great prosecutors out there. There are. So many people that, that work so hard for these cases. There are. And I wish so badly that you had a different team because it really could have been so different. Me too. So different. Now, I did want to mention that Sarah has released a statement on Voices for Justice, and I'd like you to listen to it there versus us inserting it here because she is donating all of the profit. And can you explain who you're donating that to? Yeah. So I'm donating to Defenders of Children in Arizona. They're the, the organization that worked for me or worked with me, but I actually knew them from when I worked with kids in foster care. So they do things like represent kids in foster care. They represent, you know, um, families that have been abused. And David is such a shark and such a wonderful person. It's funny because when it's a nonprofit, I think people think, you know, it's going to be this like, you know, uh, bargain lawyer or whatever. And he is a shark. He is excellent at what he does. He's just has this heart of gold and he fights for these kids and these families so hard. And he fought for me so hard. So all the proceeds of that, all the proceeds of my uh, Patreon and merch throughout the end of the year are going to them because I can truly never thank them enough. So all the proceeds from that uh, update is is going to Defenders of Children Arizona. That's amazing. I think that's that is so cool that you're doing that. And I'd, I'd really like to learn more about them. They sound like an, an incredible team. Yeah. So moving on, I think something that we both really want to talk about is the 2020 special that aired recently. And I didn't watch it at first because I just felt angry. I finally did watch it. I know you still haven't seen it. Um, I felt like I had to see what was presented and, you know, kind of see what was out there. And it was shocking to me. It was really frustrating to watch. The night that it aired, my a family friend of ours reached out to me and was like, oh my God, I just saw you in 2020. So cool. And I'm texting him back and I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm really upset about it. I'm good friends with Sarah. And I was kind of explaining to him, you know, I I cannot believe Michael was acquitted. And he goes, the stepfather? Because he's only halfway through the episode sure. at this point. And then I was so confused. Like, does he – because in the way he was saying it to me, it seemed like that was so out of the question for him. And then when I watched the episode myself, I'm like, of course he thought that. Because in the beginning, they made him look, in my opinion, like a good dad. Daddy's so worried about you and – you know, it just, it completely gassed him up in the beginning. And it's frustrating thinking about how many people maybe just saw the intro of that and didn't finish the episode and don't even know the truth. Obviously they did by the end share a lot more, but the fact that he was even interviewed, how do you feel about that? The fact that he was given that platform by 2020. Yeah. I mean, obviously I don't like it. It's just gross to me. The thing about that is it's not that I don't want his side of the story out there. He has every right to tell his side of the story. Yeah. Where I get upset is that the main part of his story is disparaging Alyssa, who mm -hmm. I think everybody forgets at the end of the day was a child. Yes. She just turned 17. She mm -hmm. was abused by this man her entire life, you know, and yeah. he abused me too. We were both abused. So it's everything I don't like in true crime. Mm -hmm. The wild speculation, the sensationalism of it all. Mm -hmm. I hate playing that game of like, is he innocent or is he not? Let's just talk about the facts. And they, you know, it's clearly for entertainment. Mm -hmm. It's what I always call like the old school true crime audience, like kind of yes. the older group who grew yes. up with these programs that were really sensational, the dun 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 and oh, reenactment. It's so and, awful. I can't yeah. stand it. So I'm just – I'm not into it. I don't think that it does a great job for anyone usually telling those stories in that fashion. Mm -hmm. It's not entertainment and they take it as pure entertainment. And another thing that was so frustrating is I begged 2020 to do an update episode for years. I spoke with them. I, I knew this girl, Rachel, who was fantastic. She was always really lovely to me. And the whole time they said, we can't do it unless your dad talks. And then the second my dad was arrested, they said, we want to do this. We want to follow the court trial. Will you do it with us? And I'm like, well, now I can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then by the time the trial was over and they came back to me, I was like, I don't want to. You know what I mean? They're, they're, it's a different fight now. I'm not fighting to get Alyssa media attention anymore. So thinking about doing that show, I was like, all it's going to do is cause pain. It's not going to help her. I don't know how it's going to be edited. There's no reason to put myself through that torment. You know, my first experience with them was awful. And I was very honest with them about that. And so were most of Alyssa's friends and family. My aunt told them the same thing. She didn't want to be a part of it. Neither did any of her friends that did the first episode. So that's why they got so few people really. 
they because everyone was telling them yeah. no, nobody mm-hmm. wanted to do it because mm-hmm. they didn't think they had Alyssa's best interest at heart. And again, I have not watched the episode, but from what everybody tells me, I think it's true. They just mm-hmm. it was entertainment. Oh, totally. It was so it was so salacious. And so can you explain more about what your experience was like in the first time that you worked with 2020? Yeah. So I had just turned like 19. It was, you know, not long after my dad was arrested for the pipe bombs and all that. And they came to me and they said, we want to feature your sister. You know what I mean? We want to give her the spotlight she deserves. You know, we want to hear your dad's side of the story because at this time I was still on my dad's side. I could not comprehend that he may have been involved. And so they told me it was going to be all about Alyssa, you know, not about my dad, blah, blah, blah. They came and interviewed me. They they had the, like, they had me do the weirdest things, like, because mm-hmm. for anybody who may not know, we moved directly across the street at one point. So the house Alyssa went missing from was literally, you could see it out the front window or whatever, or yeah. see it out the window or the door. So they said, can you look across the street and look sad? I remember you telling me this. And at the time, I was like, whatever, like, it's TV, like, I'm game, like, it's, you know, it's about Alyssa, we're going to get her name out there. And when the show came on, I was like, what the hell? Like, it was all about how terrible my dad was, which looking back, like, how else could you frame it? You know what I mean? But it's the expectation they set for me. They told me it was not going to be that way. And then it was. And And at that point, you were still supporting your dad. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, my world was shattered. Looking back, I understand why they phrased the story that way. I don't understand why they couldn't be honest with me about it because they weren't. Yeah. I feel very deceived into doing that and it just put a bad taste in my mouth. Well, I think you made the right decision not being part of it. And I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who watched it that are like, why isn't Sarah here? There's got to be a reason, you know, to not hear from you. And it was frustrating for me to watch and see how little credit you were given for all the work that you had done. I mean, I, they said something, it was like 30 seconds, but it was, it was so focused on other people, including Octavia, um, which we will get into. Well, and like, I don't need the credit, right? Like, I don't need them to be like, Sarah solved this or did this. No, of course you don't. But I, I think you deserve that. And I know that's not, that's not what you're in this for and that's not what you want, but like, I think you deserve that. And I think it's an amazing story and inspiring to other people out there. And I think it should be highlighted more that when you're not getting that coverage or, you know, you're, you have a cold case or a case that's not being picked up or not, there's no movement going on that you can take it into your own hands, get on social media and it's inspiring. And I think they missed that opportunity to share that with the viewers, um, I, I just, I was frustrated for you. What was the reaction that you were getting from people online, random people online, but also people who are your supporters about the 2020 special? It was a lot of mixed reactions, most of it negative. Um, okay. It was, why is nobody participating in this? Where is Sarah in all of this? Mm-hmm. Did you ask Sarah to be involved? Which to be fair, yes, they did. I declined. But that was the biggest thing. And people were like, this is so salacious. It's making him look, you know, to be innocent in the mm-hmm. beginning. It makes him look like, you know. Yeah. He's better than he is. So the the feedback wasn't good. And I was like, wow, I'm really not going to, really not going to watch this. And then. I wouldn't. Well, and then the feedback was, why is this girl, Otavia, like the star of the show? Didn't she hurt your family? And, you know, and I didn't even know she was going to be a part of it until I was told. Um, And that's what's so hard. That's my issue with it is they platform so many people that hurt Alyssa. Mm -hmm. And that's what upsets me because I, I, in a way, signed up to be in the public. You know what I mean? I signed up for that. I can take criticism all day. The second you mess with somebody I love, that's when I get really frustrated and really upset. Like, Of course. Don't hurt Alyssa. She was a child. And and they really did make Otavia seem like the, the hero in all of this. And honestly, I wouldn't have been so disturbed by it had it not been for the statement she made right before trial and the statements that I believe hurt Alyssa's case in the end. What were those statements? So it's such a long story, but Otavia gave an interview where she basically framed me as a monster. Like I was the worst person on the planet. She read like, you know, one side of our text messages, which was a friendship falling out. I know, you know, we can talk about that. But the biggest thing was she tried to say when we went to court over my right to talk about Alyssa, over this injunction against harassment, she tried to say that I lied under oath. You know what I mean? that was – that was the part that scared me. It, mm-hmm. And because the state brought it up too, which blows my mind. Like the fact that I had to deal, I'm like shaking right now, the fact that I had to deal, it's so scary. I had to deal with this podcast drama in the middle of Alyssa's trial was so disturbing to me because it, 
for me, it seemed very clear that it was an attack on my credibility. Like say I'm mean or whatever, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But to say that I lie under oath right before I'm supposed to testify for Alyssa is an attack on Alyssa. It's a clear attack on Alyssa. And that worried me so much. That made my anxiety a hundred times worse for the trial because I was like, wow, what if the jury hears this and they don't think that what I'm telling about Alyssa is true? Mm -hmm. I already know the defense is going to attack me. And now there's these weird claims that I lie under oath in court. It just, and it confirmed my worst fears that she never cared about Alyssa. So let's explain who she is for people that don't understand and kind of your history here, because I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Missing Alyssa podcast. And I know that that has sometimes been, you know, overshadowing the work that you're doing. When did she start that? Because that was when there wasn't much coverage on the case. Yeah. So, I mean, I had been working for a few years before that to get media. I worked with like John Lorden before that. Yes. And I think it was about 2016 um, that she and actually this this wonderful author, this New York Times bestselling author approached me and they wanted to do a podcast about Alyssa. And I told her this later on. I really didn't like her in that first meeting. She was really, really? yeah, she was really aggressive. She had asked me, do you think your dad really loves you? And oh my God. At that time, I still had a hard time believing that my dad was going to go through with his domestic terrorism plot. Mm -hmm. So she asked, do you think your dad really wanted to kill all those people? And I was like, I don't know. I don't think so. And she was like, well, if your dad killed your sister, why wouldn't he kill other people? Just like very brash to the point. And the author woman um, was very, very kind and warm. And like, and I was like, oh, she has all these accreditations, right? Uh, Otavia had like I can't remember if she was still interning and perhaps not graduated from college at that point yet, but she was very green in journalism. It was this author I wanted to work with. Mm -hmm. They said, Mm -hmm. we want to make this podcast about your sister. And I was like, let's do it. I'm game for anything. I'm an open book. You know, my whole mission right now is getting media. So let's do it. And eventually the author woman dropped out. And, you know, Tavi was like, it's just me. And I was like, okay, let's do it. You know what I mean? No problem. So that's how it all started. They approached me and wanted to do this show. And I said, yes. And over the years, Otavi and I gained a really close friendship. I mean, yeah. at a certain I would have called her my best friend. And, really? And I don't think that's crazy. You know, oh. our, our text messages show that. We were talking about so many things beyond Alyssa. We were doing so many activities beyond Alyssa. It was a, it was a true friendship. Okay. And, and where did things go south with her? It's hard to say. I think the friendship of it all like really clouded my judgment. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was so optimistic about this business when I was first in it. I was like, everybody wants to help and everyone's wonderful and I no, love everyone. I was like that too. Yeah. And I trusted her. At a certain point, I was doing so much for the podcast that she actually hired me to be – we decided that my responsibilities encompassed what would be a chief operating officer. So we were close. But little things started to come out. I remember one of the first things, and it seems so small, but I have a hard time when – somebody deceives me. We went on this hike and we were talking about like guys and stuff. It was before crime con. We took this picture together and she posted me and Sarah talking about Alyssa like we usually do something like that. And I remember texting her and I was like, Hey, like I get that you have to do promo and I definitely encourage promo, but you know, that's not what happened when we hiked and it just feels kind of weird. And I don't like things to, you know, I, I, I don't like to be dishonest with our audience, like, mm-hmm. you know, with her audience, whatever. I, I hate dishonesty that way. Yeah. And she blamed it all on Brooke, the intern who, you know, yeah. uh, Brooke saw your video. She's amazing. Mm-hmm. Love Brooke. Yeah. She, Shout out to Brooke. Yeah. She's a journalist now. And she blamed the caption of that post on, on Brooke. She says, well, Brooke wrote that. And later on, I would discuss it with Brooke. And she showed me the screenshot where Otavia told her to say exactly <laughs> that. Wow. And – I was just like, mm, okay, that's weird. And, you know, throughout the friendship, there were other things too. I remember we went to an opening for her boyfriend at the time was an artist and he had like a big show opening. I don't know what you call it. I'm not a fancy art person, but she invited me and we went, you know, again, we were friends. We were yeah. best friends. Yep. And it was at the same time where she was featured in a local magazine and we were actually approached by these assistants for the mayor at the time. I think it was the mayor or the governor. And we were talking about that, uh, Alyssa. And they were like, yeah, he's super interested in Alyssa's case. He wants to help. And in the middle of that conversation, Otavia says, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to name her boyfriend at the time, but he's getting really upset that the attention is being taken away from him. And he actually, like, you should probably leave. And so I was like, oh, okay. Like, you know, and I was like trying to get their contact information to like follow up later. And then I I left. It was small stuff like that, that later on became big, you know, a big catalyst um, was also CrimeCon. Unfortunately, we went to CrimeCon together. And before we went, 
I said, you know, because I had just signed on to be like chief operating officer or whatever at that point. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm here to advocate for Alyssa. I'm not here working for the show. I've been planning for this for months, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, it was like the stupidest thing. She was not invited to a party that I was invited to. And by the end of the event, I went to her and was like, I can tell that you're upset. Like, let's talk about it. I was up in her hotel room, you know, and she was upset even at me not wanting to stay in the hotel room with her, even though I explained, I said, I don't, I'm going to be probably very overwhelmed from crime con. I want my own room in a different hotel. I don't want to be surrounded by this. Totally. And she was pissed by that. And really? Yeah. Like she, she never understood the sensitivity of it, in my opinion, because she could never understand where I was coming from. Mm-hmm. So she was pissed that I wasn't staying on property. She was pissed that I wasn't there soon enough. She was pissed that I wasn't, you know, that she wasn't invited to this party that I did try to get her invited to. I showed her the text and said, look, I asked if you could come. Like, I'm sorry. It's only like 10 people. It's an Airbnb. It's small, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I went up to her room and I was like, are you upset? And she was like, yeah, you know, it's a trigger for me um, because I was bullied in school for being so thin and beautiful, which Mm -hmm. whatever. I'm not here to talk about people's triggers, but she tried to like later use that against me as if she didn't say it. Um, and after Crime Con, you know, I connected with Brooke, who was very concerned because Otavia had told her that she didn't want Brooke advocating for my father's arrest. So Brooke really had this like crisis. You know, she was there from you. She was there to fight for Alyssa. Yep. And she's like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, well, you know, you do what you need to do. And she was like, you know, but there's more. She's been lying to you. The entire time at Crime Con, um, she was with this other person who worked for a podcast And they were talking badly about you the entire time. And it made me extremely uncomfortable. And so I was like, what's going on? You know what I mean? And so I go to Autavia and I'm like, listen, like, do you want Brooke to advocate or not? Like, what are you talking about? And for the first time ever, she was like, well, I have to like draw this line in the sand. I'm a journalist. I can't publicly say I want your father arrested, Mm -hmm. which is news to me. Like, I even have a text from her saying, you should consider me a friend and advocate in private and just a journalist to the public. And I'm like, I don't, I don't operate that way. You know what I mean? Like, it's either we're honest with each other or we aren't. Like, there's not these secret parts or whatever. And if she had established that line up front that she didn't want to advocate, I would have never worked with her. And she knew that. So really, it just started coming out that she wasn't treating Brooke well. I was told that Brooke would be paid for her work as an intern, Mm -hmm. and Brooke never was. And I was upset by that. You know, I was COO at this time, and I was like, that's not a good look. I'm not running around with unpaid interns or whatever. Yeah. You know, and she didn't treat Brooke very well at the event, which is Brooke's story to tell. It was just a terrible, terrible experience. And, you know, near the end, she was saying one thing and doing another. You know, for example, we had another event, the True Crime Podcast Festival, where we we were supposed to both present about ethics and true crime. And I was trying to pretend like everything was cool. Like I went up on stage, like poured her water. We hugged. I was like, nobody needs to know, right? I was like, the podcast is fine. Whatever let people listen to the podcast. I was never trying to like take away from that. But she like slighted me on stage. It was really weird. I forget exactly what the question was, but it was like something about getting effective interviews. And she said something to the effect of like, well, when you're so close to the case, you just can't get an effective interview. And I like, I'm very honest about how I feel with people, right? I interjected right on stage and said, I actually disagree. You know what I mean? I think I got a great interview from my dad. What was really upsetting is after I got back from the event, I saw an interview she did with the, I believe it was the Chicago Tribune. And she said that she was trying to spark a prosecution of my father. And so I went to her and I was like, which is it, man? You know what I mean? Are you trying to advocate? Because that's what you're telling the media and you're telling me that you can't advocate. What is it? And we went back and forth. And, you know, in the end, she was like, you're right, blah, blah, blah. Like, that is what I said. I can see how that's confusing. And so many times I try to say, thank you so much for everything you did. I think it's best if we don't work together. And she would say, you know, well, I understand that probably wasn't a great idea to work together, but hopefully we can still be friends. And I was like, I don't trust you. Like, you know what I mean? I was like, thank you so much. I don't think that's a good idea. I just kind of want to go our separate ways. And in my opinion, through those text messages, I think she was getting scared that me and Brooke were finally talking to each other about her because I, mm-hmm. I try to maintain professional. Yeah. yeah. I try to be professional with Brooke. I'm not going to sit there and like talk smack about her employer or whatever. Right, right. But when we started comparing notes, we realized that she was being deceptive to both of us. And I think wow. she, she knew that. And she even said something like, I knew the second Brooke got involved, it'd be bad. Triangles with, you know, girls or whatever, are always bad. And I just, 
again, was like, thank you so much. I think we should go our own ways. And she kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And I finally was like, I think you're predatory. I, You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't trust you anymore. You're a predatory journalist. You used me. You hurt me. And it all came out. And it kind of came to an end at a certain point. And then eventually, um, after like maybe a week or two, I reached out because I had gotten this threatening DM from my uncle um, that said something to the effect of like, if you're hanging out with Octavia, you should be careful or something. And so I literally wrote like, hey, our shit aside, like you should know about this. Like, because in no world do I want her to like get hurt. I just wanted to like, yeah, I just wanted it to be done. It was so painful, you know, ending the friendship. And because I really thought that she cared about Alyssa, but I was like, hey, like, you have a child, like, you know, this is important. Like, Arsha decide, please be careful. And she would later use that against me. And it was a weird few weeks of us going back and forth and not really saying very kind things to each other. And the way that um, our communication ended was uh, I was trying to get Alyssa's records. And throughout our entire friendship, she had told me, um, you can have Alyssa's records when I'm done. They were incredibly expensive. You can have them when I'm done. So I reached out and said, hey, I'm trying to get Alyssa's records. I don't think they're going to give them to me. You always said you would give them to me. Will you? And she's like, they're in a storage unit. And I was like, <laughs> okay, like, can you can you get them? And she was like, mm, I, you know, I forget exactly what she said, but it was basically like, no. And I was like, I'll pay you for the records. I'll give you credit. Like, what do you want? And she was basically like, why would I help you? Um, oh and then, God. Mm -hmm, and then said, you shouldn't have burned those bridges with police. I warned you against that. And of course, I'm like, no, you were behind me the entire time because she was. When people were flooding the Phoenix PD Instagram page with justice for Alyssa, she was all for it. I have the text messages. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had to go back and look because I was so gaslit that I was like, am I remembering it wrong? And I went back and she supported me the entire time. And then I finally got the records and I said, um, you know, looks like I'm not crazy after all or whatever. I got these records and they weren't as expensive as you said, by the way. And then she was like, you're crazy. Leave me alone. Never talk to me. If I catch you slandering me online, I will like take legal action or something. And I think my last text to her was, my, that sounds like a threat to me, you know, because mm -hmm. she kept, you know, the legal action. And at this point, I had no money. And so the power balance was so out of whack there. But yeah, so that's that's kind of how it ended. And then a few months after we stopped talking, I get this last text from her that says she has information about my mom's death, that my dad says that my mom overdosed on opiates, which is, for people who may not know, is one of the, the theories in Alyssa's case, too, is that my mom died uh, shortly before her life insurance policy was up, and my mm -hmm. her sister was concerned about a morphine overdose, blah, blah, blah. So it was very relevant, and I wanted to know that information, but I knew that it was so toxic that I had to walk away, and I did nothing. I said nothing. And then um, like maybe close to a year later, maybe like six, nine months, I don't know, I get a knock at my door from the Phoenix Police Department and I'm being served with an injunction against harassment from Octavia Sapala because of a tweet I made. And then mm -hmm. uh, she she alleged that I was like every bad review on her podcast, that yes. like that everything I was saying was about her. And I went to a lawyer because I was like, listen, I have the right to free speech. Like mm -hmm. she can't intimidate me like this. And quickly the lawyer was like, well, you realize that the way that she words this, she says that you cannot talk something like you can't talk about the content of her podcast. And that's your sister. So legally, she could limit you from talking about your sister. And I was like, oh, we're going all the way. We're fighting this. Like, I'm not doing this. And this <laughs> amazing lawyer in like, I swear, like 48 hours or something, got all the text messages, went through them and was like, yeah, we're fighting this all the way. This is absolutely insane. And we went to court over it. And in the end, I won. The judge was like, this is the most high school thing I've ever seen. This mm -hmm. is obviously a falling out between friends. And I agree. It was 100% a falling out between friends. And I learned, and I've never really talked about this before, but I learned in that court that um, it was actually one of Alyssa's detectives that texted Octavia and said, hey, have you seen this tweet? It looks like she's going to like go after you or something. Mm -hmm. You should file an injunction against harassment. And let's let's explain that tweet too, because that's that's what she was most angry about. It seemed from her episode on that podcast we mentioned, where she she really comes out and slanders you. Yeah, I mean straight slander, straight lies. That tweet was basically like, I'm going to tell the real reason why I started my podcast, which is a large variety of reasons. Yes, 
And she argued that it was all about her. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you go back through our text messages, I told her I was going to make content. In fact, she wanted to put my entire Justice for Alyssa blog that got great traffic Mm -hmm. behind a Patreon paywall. She wanted that interview with my dad where he said the deathbed confession thing behind her Patreon paywall. And I said, hey, I signed up to do everything for your show except for content. Content's on you. And she was pissed. By the time we settled in court or whatever, it was just... It was just awful. I mean, I don't even know how to describe it other than just complete shock and horror. And I didn't talk about it for a long time. I alluded to it a little bit, but she thought this, apparently this whole tweet was about her. And the same mm-hmm. way she thought every bad review was about, you know, was me secretly saying yeah, it. Yeah, she actually thought you were making other accounts and writing bad reviews. And for the record, is that true? No, it's not true. You know, and it wasn't a surprise to me that she wanted me to not move forward and talk about Alyssa. She was extremely possessive the entire time. And I think I can only see that looking back. Like, you know, when I did your show back in 2018, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, can you believe it? Like, look at all this traffic we're getting. It's gonna be so good for Alyssa. And like one of her first things was like, yeah, but why didn't Kendall mention me? Can you go back and ask her? And at that time, like I wasn't asking people to like correct any, like if they got Alyssa's name wrong, I was like, whatever, you know, just thank you so much for featuring her. Like grateful, grateful, grateful. Can you for the record clear up Her biggest accusation against you is that you lied under oath. And I know you mentioned this, but can you explain that more? Yeah. So when we went to court um, and they asked me, was the tweet about her or whatever? And I said, no, that was her argument that uh, I lied under oath because it really was about her. In her mind. In her mind. Because I later made a tweet Mm -hmm. um, where I was like, no, it wasn't Autavia that did this. I had to like start a brand new podcast. And that isn't to say that that's the reason I started it. Mm-hmm. Basically, what I was saying is that if Autavia did what she promised she would do, there would, you know what I mean? Like it would have been a totally different path for me. I would have never needed to like be in the spotlight the way I would have. And again, I argue, I told her I was going to make content about Alyssa way before this ever even came up. Mm-hmm. So she knows I didn't start that podcast because of her. She knows that. that. That was the thing is she went and said, you know, Sarah lied under oath and I have the proof here. And it's such a huge accusation to make against someone. And if she would have done that after trial, whatever. Literally, whatever. She has a right to say whatever she wants, right? Yeah. But doing it right before trial, trying to discredit my testimony for Alyssa, I was so distraught over that. Yeah. Like that is a different type of blow. It's very serious. Hate me all you want, but to jeopardize Alyssa's justice right before the trial and then go on 2020 and act like the hero I know. and say the things that she did, like, it, it's my understanding that she says, like, I thought my dad was innocent yes. until That's her one podcast. Thing I, I wanted to bring. I'm not, I believe it was 2020 that said that. Yes. That you, yeah, it was because of the Missing Alyssa podcast that you changed your mind on your dad. Can you set the record straight on that? Yeah, no, it, that's obviously not the case. I changed my mind on my dad way before that, many years before. And again, I'd done so many other features. I was, you know, I was interviewed for the local news talking about it. I reached back out to 2020 and said I didn't think he was innocent. I did the series with John Morden. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, another family member was interviewed and she came to me and said that interview was so traumatic. I will never do another interview again. And they reached out, these family members, not me, and tried to have the interview pulled and she never responded back. And what's so interesting to me is she she has no problem going out there and reading all of your text messages. I mean, on this podcast she did, it was done in a way that it was just like layering them on. I mean, they literally like morphed the ends of the sentences together. So it just sounded like this run on, like you're just this bully who was coming at her, coming at her, coming at her. But they never read any of her text messages. Mm-hmm. There was no context. There's no backstory about anything that she did. So it's just – trying to make her look really professional and that there was nothing that she did wrong and that you just went crazy. Exactly. You were mean for that, no reason, bullied her. Yeah, that's the narrative, right? Crazy family member. Yeah. Crazy family member. That's what you always hear. And mm-hmm. I will say, you know what I mean? Did I say those things to her? Absolutely. But in yeah. context, in private yeah. to her, mm-hmm. did I call her a predatory journalist? Absolutely. To her, I mean, to her face over text, right? Yeah. So I sa- I did say those things to her, you know what I mean? But not like that and not in that context and not like in one day or one hour. Yeah. And that's how they tried to make it seem like it's just this berating I can show the walls of text from her, but you know what? The judge told us not to. The judge was like, I don't want to see these text messages online or something, so I'm not going to do that. And she did anyway. I think another thing that was so confusing about her statements that she made was she acted like she was completely unaware of 
you know, these court documents I was talking about, about going to court to fight for my right to talk about Alyssa back, you know? Yes, yes. She, it seemed like she was pretending to be like really confused and maybe she just forgot, right? But there's a court document from my lawyer where we fight for my legal fees back, where it says in black and white language, this prohibited uh, Sarah from potentially talking about her sister, you know, something better legal language than I'm saying right now. But it was there. It was filed with her lawyer. I have to presume that she read it, but it was all there in black and white. Like, she, you know, she's like, I can't, I don't know what she might be talking about or thinking of. She knew. It was right there in the language. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just so it's just so not necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, and I get that nobody likes for bad behavior to be exposed like that. And to be honest, I'm not sure I would have ever gone into it as in depth as I am now, unless, you know, if she didn't make those statements. But yeah. like I told her over text message, if she's gonna lie about me, I'm gonna defend myself. It's mm -hmm. just it's not fair to make me out to be this monster and to be crazy and to pretend that we had this super professional, yeah. you know, journalist family member relationship where I was crossing the line when the line was never there at all. I'd like to know more about where you think the future lies for Alyssa's case and any future goals that you have that you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, of course. You know, there are avenues I'm trying to explore in terms of getting more justice for Alyssa. But outside of that, it's about having her legacy live on. You know, mm -hmm. one of the biggest motivators for me to keep going to like at my lowest moments where I'm like, I just don't want to do this and it just hurts so much is getting messages from people who say Alyssa's story helped them and it makes me so emotional um, because that's all she would have ever wanted is, you know, I, I've gotten messages from sisters saying, I got my sister out of abuse because I heard your story and we didn't realize what was going on. I had somebody that um, their their parents worked for some type of like residential school for kids and she was like, I'm going to confront my dad and get out of here. And it, it's those. So I, I hope the future for Alyssa is changing true crime. And I, you know, and it's gotten, it's taken me so long to get to this point to finally admit it, but I, I do think that she has. I think it's been screamed at me enough that Alyssa has changed true crime. Um, so yeah. Do you feel that there's a chance that her body will be recovered one day? I hope so. The thing is, getting her remains back never meant much to me. I'm not that person, right? Like, I, I don't need her remains to feel close to her or to put her at rest, if you will, for me. Um, but now that my father's been acquitted, that's something that I think about all the time. And it's something that I really, really want. And I will say that there's never been a single search for her. So that's something I am working on behind the scenes is to get that done. Because it's just one piece of this puzzle that has never been done. So I hope so. I want that to happen. And I'm trying to take steps to make that happen. And I heard you talk on a TikTok live at some point about kind of what theories you have as far as where her remains are. Do you feel comfortable sharing kind of your theories on that? Yeah. And I, I've touched on them before, obviously, on my TikTok lives, which is where yeah. I'm super candid. Yeah. Um, they're great. You got to follow her on TikTok and catch some of those. Yeah, those are my people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Everyone's my people. Every, thank you to everyone. I'm not trying to isolate any audience, but um, I, I, it's just a unique thing on TikTok. It is. Had. It is. Um, but yeah, you know, I think one is Desert Center, California, right? That's the place that all these journalists have gone out to, to, you know, show a picture of the desert and nobody has ever looked. And I say that because my father named it in his manifesto. Yes, he did. He said that um, two men killed Alyssa and he killed those two men. And they said that she was buried in Desert Center, California. And these were people, according to him, from the union. Yes. Long story short, the people were real people that died of like other causes. The police did look into it. Those They were real people that he knew, apparently, or at least looked up their name. Hmm. Um, but yeah, these union people. And then he like Bruce Willis style killed them. You know, but th the point is... The detectives always told me that um, they're always finding these like kernels of truth in what my dad says. So even in the first 2020 episode, they say that they want to search Desert Center, California, but it's never happened. It's, you know, admittedly a very large area. It's it is. dangerous to search in the desert. For sure. Um, but I've had offers that the police have refused. Um, so I would like to figure out if there's a way that we can work together in the future to get that done in Desert Center, at least small patches, perhaps at a time, something. Um and then, you know, another area that has always been on my mind is uh, the small liar house. So yes. we used to drive like our go-karts up there. It's like just kind of like maybe a mile from where we used to live. Um, and the thing is, at the time, they were building a shopping center. And my father was an electrician for a very long time, which means he understands how building schedules work, right? Mm -hmm. um, construction is a very unique field. And I did some research into it. And there were open holes 
at the time that Alyssa went missing. And from my understanding, from my research, I'm not an expert, but um, my understanding is that once they dig these holes, they'll do, so they'll do like ground penetrating radar to make sure they're not going to hit like pipes right. or electricity or whatever. Yes. And then they dig the hole. And after that, they never really check it again. So there's an opportunity to, you know, put something like a body in there, cover it with some dirt, and nobody will ever look at it again. Yeah. Then it gets filled with cement and that's the end. So that's a harder battle. I've actually tried to ask them all mm -hmm. um, before and they've never responded to me. It, you know, I, I understand that it's a big undertaking, but what I was asking for is ground penetrating radar that can go beneath that concrete. Um, so I would love for that to happen. I think it's more of a reach than trying to look in Desert Center, California. And then the third option is my uncle's property. It was this family property that was owned up north. And I had some private conversations with my uncle that I've never aired um, at his, you know, request. But he did say that he thought Alyssa might have uh, been put into this, basically this hole in the ground that filtered into like a river or something. Mm. And he said they would put things in there and they would never see them again. So no. I I would love to search up there. The police actually did go up there, um, basically just like, and this is how I found out actually, they um, talked to the owners of the house. The owners told their daughter and their daughter messaged me and was like, oh my gosh, did you know the police were just at my parents' property? It's your old, you know, family property, whatever. Um, but they never searched. They just went up there and like asked them questions and then they were like, okay, bye. So um, those are my three top contenders. So in your dad's newly found freedom, he has decided to start a YouTube channel. What do you think about that? Yeah, I hate it. I, I mean, of course I hate it, right? Um, but yeah, he's making posts about how he uh, wants to kind of take the torch now. He says nobody's looking for Alyssa, so now it's on mm -hmm. him. He has mm -hmm. to do it. He wants to start a podcast. He began posting some shorter videos on YouTube where it's really just the same nonsense. It's nothing I haven't heard before um, outside of Kind of this new storyline of him thinking Alyssa was trafficked and how he wants to um, – it's very Sound of Freedom. He wants mm -hmm. to go to mm -hmm. South America and recover American women. And he's talking about how he's going to need funds to do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's thinking about raising money. And and that's what scares me. Um, so that's why I hate it. Like, tell your side of the story all you want. But to, again, Bruce Willis in his own mind or whatever, right? He wants to get a team together. He wants to get healthy and go down there himself and go rescue these women or whatever. And it's just, it's so ridiculous. And I am so scared that people are going to give him money. You know, I've already seen comments that are like, I saw the 2020, I believe you. And that's the danger. And giving him airtime that is edited. You know what I mean? Let yes. him talk unfiltered. Right. And I think that says everything. Do you think you will ever have that conversation with your father on his deathbed? No, I think one, you know, my brother who is close to him would never tell me if he really was on a deathbed. Two, he's going to live forever, unfortunately. He's like so healthy and it's wow. ridiculous. Um, I know that he tries to say that he isn't. He came in in the wheelchair, but mm -hmm. he was walking fine without it. He was hiking, you know, if, every week or whatever before he got arrested. And the biggest point is I don't think he's kind enough to give me that closure. I think if I somehow made it to his deathbed or whatever when he yeah. was dying, he would be like, no, you destroyed this family and I didn't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think he would ever give me or any of my siblings that satisfaction. Probably not. No, he doesn't love us. It's He doesn't have the empathy or capacity for that. What message do you have for other families who are going through something similar, don't know where to start, or are maybe in the process and need inspiration to keep going? Yeah, don't give up. Um, it's going to be really, really hard. It's not a fun or easy journey. And take it at your own pace. You know what I mean? I think the way that I fought for Alyssa looking back was unhealthy. I know it was unhealthy. I ate, breathed, and slept for Alyssa. You know, it was every part of my life. And I honestly don't recommend that. Um, but I get asked this question all the time by families. Where do I start? And it's a great question. And I always say, with the police, get those documents. Getting Alyssa's case file that was 3,000 plus pages or whatever changed everything. Because you're told one thing by police, you see one thing on the media, but when you read those case files, like it changes everything. So start with the files, work with the police, try to see what you can do there, try to have a good relationship with them, mm -hmm. but keep it business and don't be afraid to hold them accountable in a professional way. 
and go from there. Every case is different, right? And maybe, mm-hmm. you know, there are some cases that don't need media attention. They need something else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do believe that especially the majority of cold cases, usually the detectives will say media will help. So mm-hmm. take it at your own pace, you know, judge your case individually and try to work with police. And obviously there are cases where they will not give you the case file, but you might as well try. Yeah, try. Try every effort you can. Start mm-hmm. talking to people and just protect your heart. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Be careful who you work with. That's good advice. What would you like people who leave this episode to know, to remember about your experience, about Alyssa, to keep in mind for the future? Yeah. I mean, I always say it, um, and it may sound cheesy at this point, but like, there's always hope, right? There's always hope. And I think we're seeing that more now and now with all these cold cases getting these huge breakthroughs. And, you know, in terms of remembering Alyssa is please don't, you know, and I don't think anybody really does, but like, when you read a headline about rebellious teenager running away, Mm -hmm. think twice, Mm -hmm. think twice about it. And I just hope that people realize that um, Alyssa was amazing. And, you know, I was a thousand times worse than she was as a teenager. And bottom line, she had so much pressure on her. You know what I mean? She really was acting as my mom. And I said this in court, the jury asked, why do you say that Alyssa was so brave? And I said, because she was brave enough to stay. Mm-hmm. And that's something I learned throughout my journey is that um, she did stay for me. She wanted to leave. She talked about the abuse all the time to her friends. And she said, I can't leave Sarah there. Mm-hmm. So just remember that she was a child and a wonderful person. And overall, there there really is always hope. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and opening up to me. Um, I appreciate it so much. I know my audience will really appreciate it as well. And I know it can't be easy for you to continually talk about this. You've done so many episodes and, you know, so many different shows and obviously going through court and everything. So I just, I really appreciate your time here and trusting me to, you know, use my platform to help tell your story. And and I don't take that lightly. I I really, really appreciate it. And Alyssa is just so lucky to have you as her sister, Um, everything that you've done for her. I mean, you know, I have a sister too. And it's, it just breaks my heart thinking about that bond. But you're just such a strong person. I don't even know how to put it into words. I, I look up to you so much. I'm so inspired by you. And I know countless other people feel the same way. Thank you. Moving forward, though, how can my audience now help in the fight for justice for Alyssa? Just continue to support me. That would be fantastic. Follow me on social media. You know what I mean? Yes. I, it's the larger voice I have, the better it is, and the more people pay attention. And I wish it wasn't that way, right? I wish the world was just like, this is black and right, this yeah. is right or wrong. Yeah. But the attention does help. So um, supporting me is awesome. I appreciate it. It makes me feel better. Yeah. And it does help further the entire mission. And I again, please check out Voices for Justice, the work that Sarah does. She works you know, not only on her sister's case, but works with so many different families, does amazing coverage of their cases. And what is next for you? What's next for Sarah Turney? So many things. I mean, of course, everything is rooted in Alyssa, right? Like uh, her legacy will forever live on and there will be projects about her. Mm -hmm. Once the arrest happened, I got so many offers for so many things and I couldn't do any of it, right? Which is fine. It is what it is. I wouldn't change it. I would never do anything to jeopardize Alyssa, but now I can. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of projects coming out. I am doing a book, perhaps two books. You know, I'm revisiting Alyssa's case on my podcast, retelling it in my own words, because the first season of Alyssa's podcast is really a retelling of the case file. And it's very in-depth, probably more in-depth than it needs to be these days. Yeah. So I want to come back and kind of – like how Taylor Swift has Taylor's version or whatever. Mm-hmm. I want to do Sarah's version. Mm-hmm. Now that I can say what I want, really without any consequence to Alyssa, I have a lot more freedom to talk about certain things. So I'm redoing Alyssa's case. And I'm actually involved in a few projects with other families. You know, I've been invited to work behind the scenes with families telling their own stories in their own words, kind of, you know, inspired by my podcast. So I'm super excited to do do that. I'm working with a few different families to do that. Um, Voices for Justice is becoming a network. And I'm inviting other families to come tell their story and do it in their own words, you know, and the, the entire approach is you know, how I kind of phrased it is, you know, we know that we're family and we're not saying that we're completely unbiased. It's just, if you want to hear it from us, come hear it from us. Mm -hmm. We want to tell the stories in our own words. And I'm really empowering families to do that. So I'm working on a few seasons of that coming up, which I'm really excited about. I'm working on some unidentified stuff. Um, You know, I actually really want to 
there's this Jane Doe that always gets compared to Alyssa. And, you know, it's been said that it's not Alyssa. The police say it's not her. I want to find out who she is. I want to find out who her family is. Um, so I'm doing that. I'm doing like so many things, probably too many things. But no, I, it's great. I'm doing all the things. Um, so I'm really excited working with other families, continuing Alyssa's story and just continuing her legacy. Well, I can't wait to see all of that unfold. And it's it's great to know that we're going to get so much more from Sarah Turney because you're truly a talent. You truly care about people. And again, you just inspired me so much. So thank you for being here today. And I, of course, will link everything below of where you can follow Sarah, all her social media, her podcast, and keep up with what she's doing because your story is just beginning. Thank you. You're gonna make me cry. And you've been so inspiring to me. I could gush about you all day. We've been talking. We have dinner to get to, but thank you. I love you. Love you. All right, guys, that's going to be it for me today. I will be back next week. But until then, stay safe out there. 